black and white photographs which show the actual places where I slept on nine different islands. I was traveling to the Outer Hebrides in Scotland. And then the third grouping of works is like a small retrospective, I guess, which shows um, different landscape projects that I've done in the British Isles and Ireland and the east and west coast of Canada. Now I noticed that um, of the sequences of, of photographs here documenting the work you've done, um, the sleeping places uh, seem to be all, all the pieces are in black and white. Is there any reason um, that they're, they're different in that way from the other pieces? Well, um, the sleeping places project is um, something which shows the impression that I left in the ground just from sleeping in one spot for one night. and. Um, through the series you notice the change in the vegetation from one place to the next and I wanted that to be noticed more from the texture and and uh, it's actually a project about the texture kind of the impression left in the ground and doing it in color I think would have distracted from that just that plain sense of the difference of the texture because then it would be all kinds of different variations in the color and that just wasn't you know appropriate to that particular project now, some of the other pieces um, exhibited here have a, uh, seem to be centered around paper um, in, in the landscape. Could you tell us anything about those? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've used paper a lot um, to uh, express, essentially to express my own presence in the landscape. I was very interested in the contrast between paper and stone when I first started doing some of these um, arrangements and um, I came to realize that the paper because that was what I was placing in the landscape I came to realize that the paper actually represented my own my own presence in the landscape so the paper being very fragile it, it gets affected by the wind or the rain or whatever happens to be going on in the environment at the time it shows up right away on the paper so when the paper is getting blown around I mean so was I getting blown around and once I've taken the photograph of the project and and um, satisfied myself, depending on how long it lasts, I mean some of them only last a very short while because the wave could come in and, and wash the paper in a moment. Um, once I've taken the photograph, then I, I remove the paper and, you know, I don't leave it behind afterwards so that you wouldn't even notice that anyone had been there or, or changed anything. And in a way I'm trying to with the paper I'm trying to make a representation of that sort of fragile and temporary presence that we have. You've had a, the paper seems to represent a kind of transitory influence you've had upon the land. None of the pieces seem to uh, significantly alter the landscape in any sort of permanent way. No, um, the odd time when I don't use paper and I, and I just pick up a few stones and arrange them, I might leave the stones behind, you know, sitting there in a line or something, which if someone came across it, they would think that that didn't happen, you know, what we call naturally, that in fact there has been a human hand that has put some sense of order there, but no, I don't. Um, I don't dig holes or, or um, you know, I don't change the landscape in any kind of a way that, you know, would be very long-lasting. I just might shift the odd stone from one place to another. Now, now some of the pieces see, uh, that we'll look at show uh, rocks uh, that have been significantly moved from um, one position to another in a, in, a, in a major sort of way from the bottom of a mountain to the top of a mountain or from the seaside to uh, an, a mountain lake. Can you tell us about those? Well, um, I'm interested in kind of our human scale in the landscape and, and um, that's why I don't do projects using bulldozers or anything like that to change the landscape on that kind of scale. I'm interested in what a single person with our human scale in the landscape, kind of our relationship to those distances. So as you mentioned, there's a couple of projects where I've started um, for example, I started at the bottom of a mountain and I picked up a particular stone and I just carried it to the very top of the mountain and I left it on the top of the mountain. So the photograph shows you this stone seen from the top of the mountain. And um, partly I was interested in in the displacement of some something from one place to another. And also, it also occurred to me there is also that sense of... Um, geology where things 
take thousands and millions of years to move and change place. So it also occurred to me that this stone sitting at the top of the mountain might eventually work its way back down to the bottom again, but you know it would have to go through this incredibly slow, um, gradual geological process that takes thousands and thousands of years, which we, um, I mean, that's the scale of things that we can't actually perceive. I mean, scientists can tell us that the continents have moved, but the movement does not happen on the scale that we can perceive. Marlene, in looking around the gallery at the photographs, um, there's what's most striking, I suppose, is a powerful sense of aloneness or, or isolation in that the pieces that, that you photographed um, seem to have been uh, performed or done in, in isolation, um, the very remote locations, and there, there seem to be no people around. Um, that sort of leads me into a question about the documentary aspects of your work in, in that very few people can actually see the pieces that you've done and must rely on the photographs. I wonder if you could tell us about that. Well, I'm the only person there at the time when I've done it, and uh, that's part of the reason why I have to take the photographs, because nobody else actually sees the stone that's been moved or the paper that's there. And um, I couldn't work if there was anyone else around, I would lose my power concentration and in fact I would feel probably too self-conscious about what I was doing. And it's very hard to describe. Um, but but much, of, much, much of the work is dependent on um, the isolation of the pieces? Well, I tend to go to these remote places to work where the landscape I find um, well, I find the landscape extremely interesting in these remote places and, you know, inspiring because of that. So, like, for example, Baffin Island and the Outer Hebrides in Scotland, and I've worked a lot in Newfoundland. And Some of the pieces also document um, alterations you've made of existing, um, I suppose, uh, I'll call it works for the lack of any better term, uh, prehistoric cairns and standing stones of Britain, uh, and, y and you've altered those. Could you tell us about that? Yes, well one of the main reasons that I actually went to work in Britain and, and Ireland was because of these ancient sites, um, the stone circles and cairns and cromlechs, which are, well to my mind, because the more, th more that I visited them, the more I, I started to have my own idea what they were, because of course nobody's ever really solved the mystery what these huge stones are doing there and why were they placed there by these ancient people. So I, I came to realize more and more that the kind of gestures that were being made with these huge stones was similar to what I was interested in myself in the landscape as our human sort of presence in the landscape and how do we perceive our, um, our sense of place in the landscape and the, these huge stones were placed like markers and they're always discovering more and more relationships between the stones and the solar system and um, the passage of time. So when I've um, visited these sites, often I've used paper to really kind of underline, um, perhaps underline my own understanding of the relationship of the stones to the place where, they're, where they are. And um, the, because I, I use the paper, it, it, it's, it has quite a strong impact immediately right on the spot because it's white and it's um, quite dramatic looking right at the time but as I say once I've taken the photograph and I take the paper away then there's nothing left you know to leave any kind of change to the site which I, I mean of course I would never want to affect any change to these ancient sites I mean these stones have been sitting there out on the moors for thousands of years and they're they're still just so full of mystery and they're just so rich with this sense of um, oh I, I mean I, I don't know how to describe <laughs> it I mean every I've visited oh my over a hundred of these ancient sites now all through England and Wales and Scotland and and over to Ireland and Northern Ireland and every every single one of them I would have to say has had a different um, almost personality every single site even though it's such a simple notion you just take a few stones and you stand them around in a circle or whatever kind of configuration in each case I've always found that every single place has its own sense 
its own um, special feeling there. You speak of the impact and, and uh, that, it, that these pieces have had on you. Do you see yourself in following in the footsteps of, of the Cairn builders? Well, I've built a few Cairns <laughs> myself. Um, well, I wouldn't, probably I wouldn't make a conclusion like that that puts me, you know, as, as one of them. Uh, I still am not sure what what those uh, stone sites are, are completely um, there for. I do have a real sense that they were made by a group of people who had a real strong sense of community and believed, you know, it was a very important aspect of their their spiritual and social lives that they together had to put the effort, amount of effort that it took to sh actually move these huge stones from one place to another. And um, of course I'm just one person wor working on my own, just trying to uh, understand something of this. So I'm not working at all with the same sense of, you know, kind of a group effort of people who, who believe one thing and are, are working together to achieve that. I think what I'm leading up to asking you is, um the Cairns uh, and the Cairn builders uh, must have had some strong sense of place and, and of environment connection with the world around them. And do, do you feel that, that same kind of strong sense with environment? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm really um, amazed by the landscape. And, and uh, although I, I am an urban person, I live in cities, and I, and I enjoy what that uh, can offer me, my uh, my heart is in the landscape and that's the only reason I can do the kind of work that I do it's just what I it's I'm just following my own desire to be there and and work with the actual materials that are right there and handle them I mean it's really that simple I think everybody picks up stones and collects them wherever they go I mean I'm really not doing anything more complicated than that and um, I'm of course interested in in the poetics of that sense of souvenir and and how we pick up a stone to keep from one place and it, and it's an actual piece of that place so the way it acts as a souvenir it's it's really um it's really something quite poetic in a way because you you imbue your whole sense of that place where you were in this this one little kind of piece of it that you keep so that's common I mean I everybody I think does that Marlene we're standing in front of a piece um, I w I'd like to talk about um, particularly because I like it a lot and because I think it serves as a good um, bridge or introduction to the piece that you've done down at the government dock and it's called the high tide as it acts upon an X um, I wonder if you could tell us something about the piece how it works well um, in this case I found some stones along the beach that had seams of white I guess it's quartz right embedded in the rock and I was lucky enough to find one where there was actually an intersection of two white lines. So I collected enough stones to kind of extend the X and I actually just left it on the shore and I photographed it. And I came back the next day and of course in that time the tide had come and I noticed that the whole beach had been completely rearranged and I um, was actually amazed that I found the middle stone which I had set up the day before, I found it again and it was partly embedded in the shore and there wasn't a sign, not a trace of any of the other stones that I'd lined up the day before and you can't tell the scale here but like that middle stone is about this of that size, it's like quite a hefty stone and I, I realized how the whole shore had just been completely rearranged by the tide and uh, I think uh, well, in some in some respects, I mean, what happened here, I can't really take credit for it. It's something that happened, and partly, I had kind of set up a situation so that I could so that I could watch or or observe what the changes were. And here in North Bay, um, with the cooperation of uh, the Parks and Recreation, you built a piece down uh, along our waterfront uh, in a section of, of undeveloped waterfront. Um, I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit about it, the the rationale behind it, I suppose. 
Okay. Well, first of all, I had a wonderful time this week working on this because it gave me a chance to really look at the landscape around here in the North Bay area. And the, um, the installation that I've done there, first of all, it was very important to me to use materials right out of the landscape here in the area. So I got some granite boulders um, with some help from some artists here in the area. They helped me. And uh, I've shifted the granite boulders down to the water's edge of Lake Nipissing. And what I noticed from spending time at the edge of the lake was that there are, there are sandbars where, in fact, the waves come in from opposite directions and actually converge and cross over each other. And I was qu quite fascinated by this wave pattern. And I felt that that was the thing that I wanted to make some kind of expression of. So I've used these granite boulders to make a stone ground drawing, which is a kind of diagram, actually, of the wave pattern. And, um, well, there's another, there's another aspect to it, which, uh, I might mention is that uh, the granite boulders themselves are, I'm, I'm quite interested in the conjunction of fire and water, like those two elements. And the granite boulders, of course, granite is an igneous kind of rock, which means that it was formed under volcanic mm -hmm. action, which is like really intense heat and fire and so on. So in fact, um, moving the granite boulders down to the edge of the lake also has that conjunction for me too of, of fire and water because there's still like the sense of fire left in these granite boulders and there they are at the edge of the, the water. So there's a, there's, a few, um, there's a few rationales for it. Uh, I noticed there's a to one side of the piece there's a creek that's that's slowly encroaching uh, upon the edge of the piece, and the sandbars in, in the water beyond um, seem to be shifting and, and moving from from the currents in the water. Um, I presume this is a process you see uh, continuing, ongoing. Yes, I hope. In fact, I hope it will because the changes are the things that I I mean I accept. I I'm not trying to make. Um, a traditional sculpture in the sense of a, a separate object that an artist would, me would make to put somewhere to last, you know, as permanently as possible. In fact, I'm trying to work with the changes to see what those changes are. So the sculpture is not any kind of an artwork that could be picked up and moved and put somewhere else. I'd really like people to understand that that actual arrangement only makes any kind of sense right there on the spot where I've put it because it's directly in relationship with the landscape that's surrounding it. So it's not like a separate art object that I've put there. It, I mean, what I've done has been, I hope, in some kind of sympathy and in relationship to the landscape that was already there. It's not like putting an artwork up in a gallery where, you know, you, you have more or less a neutral space to contemplate the object. The, the sculpture is part of, I mean, the waves and the beach and everything is all part of the sculpture, but the waves are the, f you know, the main thing and because they were my inspiration. So I probably, what I would like people to notice the most when they look at my sculpture is, in fact, not the sculpture, but the waves. Right. So to alter the context in any sort of way to, to move the piece would be essentially to destroy it. Well, it, it, yeah, it, would, it, just wouldn't, uh, it just wouldn't mean anything anywhere else because the waves wouldn't be there in the shape of the beach, the lines of the sculpture, um, there is kind of a sandbar, so the sculpture kind of radiates out right along the lines of that uh, actual shape in the land there. So all those things are, are part of the sculpture, and if, and if you move the stone somewhere else, you just wouldn't have that. It, would, it just wouldn't have any meaning otherwise. So we have um, natural processes occurring um, on the location of, of the waves and the sandbars moving and, and the creek, uh, the wind and the sand itself. Um, do you see any, any kind of human interference as being a, a kind of process integral to the piece? Well, I, you know, those are probably the changes that I'm less willing yeah. to accept. Um, I'm, I'm sure it wouldn't be hard for someone, you know, to uh, 
tamper with the sculpture. I, I hope that when people see it, they realize that this is someone who did something deliberately and, and it's meant to be there, you know, for some reason. Um, if people move the stones around, well, that's just what happens because I've put it in quite a public place and the reason for putting it there is so that people will have a chance to see it. It's not way off in some remote, you know, like other places where I've usually worked way off in the middle of nowhere where nobody can see what I've done. It's been it's been exciting. Thank you very much. Um, and on behalf of Whitewater Gallery, I'd like to thank you very much for the the time you've spent with us, what you've told us about your work, and and for your work itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the exhibition here at the gallery will run until September 27th. Um, gallery hours are from 11 till 6 on weekdays and 11 till 5 on weekends. Um, for any further information about the, the work in the gallery or the piece at the dock, um, you can contact the gallery at 476-2444. Um, if you'd like to see the piece down at the government dock, head down to the dock and it's on the west end of the beach just beyond um, the, the children's park. And it will be a semi-permanent installation. And thank you very much.